here in Jacksonville, Florida. We would like to welcome you today to our segment on COVID-19. Um, I am part of the Sweetwater Medical Ministry here in Jacksonville, Florida. And our purpose today is to discuss the COVID-19 myths and facts, and of course, um, how to deal with uh, isolation right now at this time. Um, I'll be pre presenting two other speakers. Our first speaker will be myself, Dr. Brown. Uh, second speaker will be Ms. Kelly Denson. She's an RN and clinical education specialist. And then also we will be having Ms. Carolyn McCorvey, who is a licensed certified social worker. So we're gonna go ahead and start with what is coronavirus? I know the news has been um, sometimes a little bit overbearing from all the information that we're hearing, but I'm gonna try our best to explain it to where we can understand. So the coronavirus is basically um, a common virus that um, is responsible for about three to five percent of common colds, okay? Um, the reason why it's called coronavirus is because it is shaped like a crown-like structure and it has spikes on the outside of it. So um, this first virus was discovered in 1960s um, and it normally occurs during the winter months. So where does coronavirus or co COVID-19 come into play? So I'm going to explain. So we have a total of seven different types of coronavirus, okay? So four of them are common, okay, which cause the common colds, and the other three can be really deadly. Of course, we know that you can, you know, God forbid, any virus can be deadly, but um, the typical four are the ones that cause a common cold, and the other three are the ones that um, can be a little bit more severe. So just to explain the common ones, so the first one is HKU1, NL63, 2293, and OC43, those are the common ones, okay? That's the ones that, like I said, that you can get common colds from. The other three is MERS, COV, COV, SARS, COV, and then here is the COVID-19. So this one's SARS, COV-2, COVID-19, okay? So again, there's seven different types. The one that we're gonna be focusing on today is the COVID-19 one, okay? Our next topic is transmission. So how is it transmitted? So we know that it's spread person to person. New data shows that it could also be transmitted person to animal, okay? And maybe further on as more studies are done, it may be um, transmitted animal to person possibly too. So this is mainly through close contact. So for example, sneezing, talking, coughing, as research shows, when someone is speaking, when someone's talking, our saliva can travel um, certain distances, okay, up to about six feet. And so that's the reason why the social distancing of six feet comes into place. Um, but also if you touch a contaminated surface, you know, if you touch your face, your eyes, your mouth, um, you can transmit the virus that way also. So the virus gets in your system, of course, by being inhaled and it can get into your lungs and then cause um, um, you to have COVID-19. So what are some of the symptoms? Okay, so it's a very wide range of symptoms. Some patients have no symptoms, okay? So they're just going about their daily lives, not feeling anything, okay? And that uh, type of patient is called asymptomatic, okay? So that patient has no symptoms. And you can go all the way from severe symptoms, okay? So let's talk about some of those symptoms. So again, sore throat, okay? Um, decreased taste, uh, muscle ache, shortness of breath, cough, fever for several days. Um, you know, you're just not feeling yourself. You know, this doesn't feel like a normal uh, virus, okay? Um, so who's at risk, okay? So risk, of course, are older um, adults, okay, with chronic conditions. So what are chronic conditions? I know a lot of people ask that. So that's, for example, if um, you have heart conditions, if you have asthma, maybe if you have diabetes, um, those you have higher risk for complications, okay? So typically from the time that you come in contact with the virus, um, it can take anywhere from two to 14 days, okay, to actually present with some um, form of symptoms. Um, you, 
of course, like I said, you know, you may be asymptomatic, but that's, you can still transmit um, the virus, okay? So just because you don't feel any symptoms, um, you know, if you're talking to someone or, or coughing on someone or sneezing on someone and not covering correctly, yes, you can still transmit the virus, even though you yourself are not uh, symptomatic, okay? All right, let's go on to prevention. So, of course, everyone's, you know, I'm sure, you know, been at home and, you know, it's been very, you know, stressful and frustrating, you know, and, uh, you know, we're all about social distancing right now, which has been proven to help, okay, uh, decrease the uh, transmission. So social distancing is basically keeping your distance, and uh, that has been working well, uh, like we discussed. Um, hand washing, very important, okay? Uh, we know that hand washing, okay, it's when the water and the soap come in contact and the rubbing, the frequency or the friction of the rubbing also will help to decrease the amount of bacteria or even viruses on your skin. So of course the magic number is 20 seconds, okay? Um, so you wanna wash with soap and water very frequently for at least 20 seconds and you wanna do it very often, okay? Um, if, if water is not readily available and soap is not readily available, then of course um, you can use a hand sanitizer, okay, or alcohol. Um, and just keep in mind that it has to be at least 60% of ethanol or 70% of isopropanol, okay? And of course, we always talk about stay at home when you're sick, okay? You don't wanna transmit this virus uh, to anyone, okay? So prevention, social, social distancing, hand washing, and staying home when you're sick, all right? And our last topic that I'll be discussing is household items, okay? So we're gonna talk about disinfectants and also Lysol versus bleach versus Clorox. Which one is the best, okay? So let's talk about that. So if you look at the back of the Lysol can or your um, a Clorox can, it does say that it covers certain type of viruses and certain type of bacteria. okay? Um, but we need to have an understanding of what um, disinfecting is versus sanitizing, okay? So disinfecting, let's talk about that. So disinfecting means that we are actually trying to kill the germs, okay? Um, sanitizing means that we are trying to decrease the amount of germs that are actually on the surface, okay? So when you're looking at the back of your Lysol can or the back of your uh, bleach, it says that it covers human coronavirus. Okay, remember there's seven different types, okay? And then also SARS coronavirus, okay? So it has not yet been proven to cover the COVID-19, okay? So with that said, it still doesn't mean that you don't clean, okay? Still important to, of course, um, you know, clean your surfaces. You wanna keep in mind too, that of course, we don't wanna have another outbreak of something else, okay? So like E. coli, salmonella, you know, other things like that. So you wanna keep in mind too, to still clean, okay? Um, so very important, okay? Because I, I know a lot of us, we just take the can and we spray, and then we're thinking that, you know, that's good enough. But if you really read the back of the can, it says, First, that you should clean the surface with soap and water. After you clean the surface with soap and water, you need to decide if you are going to disinfect or if you're going to sanitize. If you're going to disinfect, then, then that surface has to be um, wet for at least three to 10 minutes, okay? And then you have to let that air dry. So remember, these are non-porous surfaces. So that means, you know, tables, that means, you know, doorknob, door handles, things like that, okay? Metal surfaces. Um, so again, so if you're disinfecting, uh, you have, that surface has to remain wet for at least three to 10 minutes with your disinfectant and you have to let it air dry, okay? In order to sanitize a surface, that surface has to remain wet for at least 10 seconds and then let it air dry. And again, this depends on what type of surface you are cleaning with, okay? All right, well, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm gonna also go ahead and pass over the rest of our segment or a portion of our segment to Ms. Kelly Denson, who is an RN and clinical education specialist here in Jacksonville, Florida. Hello, my name is Kelly Denson. I'm a registered nurse here in Jacksonville, Florida, and a member of the Sweetwater Church of Christ. I'm here to talk to you today about some common um, myths associated with um, coronavirus or COVID-19 as we know of it today. We are going to talk about nine myths associated with COVID-19. The first myth is People think that they don't have to dry their hands after washing them, that they can use the thermal air dryers in the bathrooms, and that that would be safer than getting a paper towel to dry your hands. However, that is a myth. Just because you use the air dryers or the heat dryers in the bathrooms, um, in facilities, it does not mean that that heat is more of a protectant than using a paper towel. It actually does not kill any additional 
bacteria or viruses that still may be on your hands. So it is okay for you to use a paper towel when you wash your hands in public places. Another thing is, the second myth is using ultraviolet light to kill the virus. So there has been some talk or conversation about using UV lights to disinfect um, your mask or your homes or your bodies. Um, that is a myth. I do realize that in um, hospital facilities, they do sanitize their rooms with UV lighting. However, that's a different process than you going out and buying a UV light for your home. That UV light can be dangerous to your eyes as well as to your skin, and it can cause skin irritation. So please do not use a UV light um, to disinfect your body or your home um, because that hasn't been effective in the household setting. Myth number three, spraying alcohol or chlorine on your person or your body is an appropriate form of disinfecting yourself from the virus. That is incorrect. You do not want to spray um, those agents on your body because again, it can be toxic. It can be irritating to the skin. It could bleach your clothing as well as it can irritate your mucous membranes, which can in turn cause you to cough, sneeze, have a runny nose, and all of the things that we're afraid of in regards to COVID-19. Myth number four, um, is it safe to receive packages from China? I know that's a popular one, especially with everyone being home due to social distancing. We have increased the amount of online shopping. I know I have. So one of the questions is, a lot of our packages come from China. Is it safe for us to open those packages? And if we open them, are we going to get COVID-19? That is a myth. You can open packages that are received that may be coming from China. However, the recommendation is that you allow the package to sit for anywhere from 24 hours to three days before opening it and making sure that you open it in a well-ventilated area. So maybe in your patio, your garage, or your front porch even. Um, and the rationale behind that is we do know that the virus can live on objects for up to about three days. So you just want to give it a little bit of breathing room before you open it, open it. Our next myth is, will eating garlic prevent you from getting COVID-19? That is also a myth. Yes, garlic has a lot of um, health properties associated with it. However, there is no proven data that you eating garlic or raw garlic um, in your drinks or food will prevent you from getting this virus again. So you don't have to do that thinking it's a preventative measure. Also, does the coronavirus only affect older adults? That is incorrect. As stated previously by Dr. Brown, the coronavirus does seem to be somewhat more severe for the older population, especially those with comorbidities. However, it can affect any age group. We do know that there are everyone from infants to older adults that have been affected by this virus. Um, so please do not get lax thinking that you don't fall within the older adult group and that you cannot be affected by the virus. Will antibiotics treat COVID-19? That is also a myth. Antibiotics treat bacteria infections and not viral infections. However, I am aware that if you are following along with the media, you will hear that some antibiotics are being given to these patients that have tested positive for COVID-19. However, it is being given to those patients because they also develop some bacterial infections and pneumonias and different things in addition to COVID-19. 
So those medications are given for those measures and not to treat COVID-19 itself. Pneumonia vaccines can prevent COVID-19. That is also a myth. At this present time, we do not have a vaccine that will prevent COVID-19. However, there are still recommendations for us to continue getting our normal vaccines for ourselves as well as our children because it will help with building up immunities and antibodies in your system. However, that does not prevent you from getting COVID-19. Myth number seven, rinsing your nose with saline every day will keep you from contracting COVID-19. That is also a myth. Yes, you can rinse your nose with saline um, as a cleansing property for your sinus canals and different things like that. However, it does not prevent you from getting COVID-19. So don't think that it does and run out and start doing it if you haven't been doing it. Myth number eight. If I hold my breath for at least 10 seconds and I am not coughing or having difficulty breathing, then that means that I do not have COVID-19. That is incorrect thinking. That is not a way to test for COVID-19. Um, yes, they do in the medical field do those type of tests for other diseases and illnesses, however, not for COVID-19. So please do not attempt to do that as a measure to determine whether or not you are infected with the virus. Instead, please take heed to the signs and symptoms that were related by Dr. Brown of things to watch for. And if you're exhibiting any of those, please then seek medical attention. Myth number nine, pets can spread the new human coronavirus or COVID-19 for us. There's been lots of talk as Dr. Brown mentioned about that. However, at this present time, we do not know that pets can definitely transmit COVID-19 to their owners. However, the recommendation is that you do limit your pets being close to your nose and your mouth or um, licking in your face or on your hands and then you putting them in your face um, because that is still uncharted waters for us and we don't have a lot of data on that yet but we do know some animals have become positive in the feline community um, where the first cases that we knew of. Um, so again, the recommendation is that we do not have our pets in our face in close proximity um, just in case they can um, pass COVID-19 on to humans. Now on to some do's and don'ts of using a face mask as well as properly wearing gloves in regards to COVID-19. So we all know that the recommendation from the CDC is that everyone wear a face covering um, or as we like to think of it as a mask. We do realize there are several different forms of face masks that are out there. There are surgical masks um, that a lot of healthcare workers have. There are some masks that are known as N95 masks, which those masks are the ones that will filter viruses and bacteria um, from the individual, which helps as that added layer of protection. Most healthcare professionals do have those type of masks, but for lay individuals or individuals like you and I that may be in our homes or out in our communities um, may not have those masks and it is okay. The CDC has stated that any face covering is better than nothing at all. So again, you can have a surgical mask or you can have a homemade mask. So if you notice around my neck, I have a homemade mask. And yes, I am a Florida State University graduate and I love my knolls. So you will see that my mask represents that. So you can get very creative um, with the mask that you have, 
or the mask that you purchase or you make for yourselves. And again, this is our new norm right now. So it's nice to make it fun um, because this is something that we're having to deal with that we've never had to deal with before. You can also be very creative with your children if you have children and get them something that appeals to them as well. So this is a homemade mask. Um, it is um, sewn in the style of a surgical mask. However, as previously stated, it's not a surgical mask. This is a reusable face mask that you can use in the community. What I want to talk about in regards to mask is we notice and I notice that a lot of people are wearing them inappropriately um, and that could put you at harm for actually contracting COVID-19 a lot quicker than you think. So it's inappropriate to have your mask hanging from one ear. You see that quite often when you're out getting your essential items or having your mask underneath your face like this, thinking, oh, it's in the ready position. I can just pull it up at any time. If you're not using the mask, you need to take the mask off and the outside portion, which is the dirty portion, you should take it and you should fold it in half where the clean side is now outside and the dirty side is on the inside. And you should store it in a safe place. So preferably if you have a brown paper bag or a Ziploc bag or something like that, that you can store it in until you're using it again. However, Again, there's been some talk that people think that they need to put it in a UV light or in an oven or something like that to kill the germs or the bacteria or the virus that may be on the mask. Recommendation is if you just let it sit untouched um, for up to three hours, that, that will then make it safe for you to use again if you're having to reuse it. However, if you have the mask that is washable, you could take it and throw it in the washer um, and preferably wash it on hot, if not hot, then definitely warm water to kill any um, germs that may be on the mask before reusing it. So what happens is out in the community, you will see people with gloves on and you will see them with their mask on. And so what happens is People think just because they have gloves on that that now protects them and it doesn't. It actually can sometimes cause more damage. And what I mean by that is if I have my mask on and my gloves on and I'm shopping in the grocery store and I'm picking up items with my gloves and I'm putting them in the basket and I'm doing various things while I'm in the store, I've now soiled my gloves and they're now contaminated with whatever I may have touched while I was in that facility. Now I'm going to my car, I'm opening my car door, I'm getting in my car and I take my mask off, but I still have my gloves on. So what I've now done is I have contaminated my mask with now my dirty gloves. I do realize people see healthcare workers with masks and gloves on all the time. However, what you don't see is that we do not walk around with masks on and, and gloves on 24 seven. With the new COVID-19 pandemic, we're wearing masks at all times. However, we're not wearing gloves at all times. We're wearing gloves when it is required. When we're going in to do a procedure or a treatment, or we're doing something at that particular time that is deemed we need gloves. When we come out, we're washing our hands, we're drying them like we normally would, and we're continuing to do what we do. But in the community, people are wearing gloves for extended amount of time. And because of that, they're being unsafe. Because again, you're touching your face, you're touching your face mask, taking it on and off, and you're still wearing the gloves. That is putting yourself at risk because you're not being safe because you think by having the gloves on, it negates you having to wash your hands or use a hand sanitizer or something of that nature. So please do not get complacent and think, 
wearing gloves protects you from everything because it actually does not. It makes you more careless. You then think it's okay for you to touch your face, your hair, um, your, your body in general, and then you're not washing your hands and you've carried these germs from place to place to place on your gloves. I've actually seen people in their car eating with their gloves on. Gloves that they've been out in the community with. This is inappropriate. So, if by chance you have to do something that you deem is unsafe and you want to wear gloves, definitely wear your gloves. Take them off as soon as you can. Wash your hands. If you do not have soap and water available, then use hand sanitizer. And when you can get to soap and water, use soap and water at your earliest convenience. However, do not wear gloves for extended amounts of time. It's also unsafe for the public because people are taking them off and throwing them out of their cars, leaving them in parking lots and shopping carts, and then someone has to go behind you and either clean it up or someone else is gonna grab that cart that has all of that used, contaminated items in it. So please limit the amount of glove usage that happens in the community. All right. So when you have on your gloves, the appropriate way to take off your gloves is to grab in the middle of your palm, if at all possible. You're going to pull your hand out so that you're not touching your hands at all. You now have the other glove balled up in your hand. You're going to take this hand and go down in the cuff, and you're just going to pull it right over. So one glove is sealed in the other, and the contaminated portion of the glove is covered. And then you can dispose of the glove correctly. Now, in regards to glove um, usage, of course, you want to make sure you have gloves that um, fit appropriately if you're using them. And again, you want to make sure they have no rips or tears in them or it defeats the purpose of wearing the gloves in the beginning. In regards to mask wearing, the CDC does recommend that children two years old and under do not have to wear a mask. So I have noticed that there are lots of mask makers out there that are being very creative. Um, someone actually made a mask that is hooked onto a pacifier um, but that is actually not a recommendation from the CDC, and it can also be a safety hazard for the child. So please make sure you're being safe in regards to COVID-19 and protecting yourself as well as protecting others. Thank you. Please do not wash your hands with gloves on thinking that you can reuse them. Also, do not put hand sanitizer on top of gloves, also thinking that you can sanitize the gloves for reusal. One of the main reasons why we don't do that is because it can destroy the integrity of the glove, which again will put you at risk because it makes the gloves easier to rip or tear, or it creates holes and makes the product um, permeable. So please make sure you're not trying to disinfect your gloves. They should be single use. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Kelly, for that, for the myths and facts and also the do's and don'ts of wearing masks and gloves. Now I would like to present our next presenter, Ms. Carolyn McCorvey, licensed certified social worker. Hello, I'm Carolyn McCorvey, as Dr. Brown said, and I am a, a licensed certified uh, social worker here in Jacksonville. And I'm going to be talking to you uh, from the mental health perspective and dealing with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And one of the biggest things that um, people are dealing with with the COVID-19 is isolation. Uh, while we try to comply with the CDC and you know various ordinance and which is important with the social distancing, it can create just a really, really bad feeling of isolation. So instead of social distancing, I've kind of re sort of rename that term and set and call it physical distancing, but social connection. 
because social connection is going to be very, very important as we deal with isolation, particularly for people who were dealing with mental health issues prior to COVID-19 and those issues don't go away, or even people who were dealing with physical uh, medical issues prior to uh, COVID-19. And you don't have the same access to your providers as you had before, and it just compounds the isolation. Now, isolation for like a single person versus a family creates its own unique challenges. And I'm going to speak to the single person first because myself, I am single. Uh, so you already live alone and now we're in a situation where you, we're required to um, distance ourselves or isolate ourselves uh, more than we've done before. That's going to be, isolation is going to look different for different people because you have some people who are kind of used to staying home. You have some people who are very outgoing. So it's going to um, present different challenges for different folks. So what do we do about that? So I'm going to talk about some strategies in terms of dealing with that. First of all, as a, a clinician, we, turn, we tend to look at things from a biopsychosocial, meaning for your mental health to be intact, your physical uh, state needs to be okay, your social involvement needs to be in line. It's all together. You really can't separate any of that. So if there are some physical health issues, please don't stay in the house and let that, you know, and not take care of that, making sure that you have your medications, making sure that you're staying in contact with your various providers, whether that be a mental health provider or your physical, uh, physical MDs or nurses or practitioners or things like that. So you're going to want to make sure that you have your medications on board um, because if you're, say, dealing with something like depression, and you're in, in a situation where you're having to isolate more than you normally would, it can definitely make the depression worse. Maintaining contact, oh my God, maintaining social contact with families and friends, there are a lot of unique avenues to do that now through Facebook Live, Zoom, WhatsApp, um, Messenger or whatever. Make sure that this is the time that you actually want to really nurture and really expand those social contacts. Then there's a, um, a God-given type of things that, chemicals that God has already given us to help us with feelings of depression and, and give us that kind of um, lighthearted, happy kind of feeling. Uh, there's chemicals that we already have, natural chemicals like dopamine, endorphin, serotonin, and oxytocin. Those are chemicals that God has already given you to be able to make you feel happy, make you feel a little bit more alert, give you a little energy, and make you feel motivated. But it's things that we can do to actually release those or make those um, more readily available to us. Stuff like exercising, walking, um, I've even started cleaning out my garage. The whole idea is that you want to be, um, you, you want to be in motion. You want to be in movement to make sure that you are giving those natural God-given chemicals to um, do what he has given them to us for, to actually help you with motivation and things like that. And also you want to, let's say if you're in a family, and now you're having to isolate where you're kind of used to having maybe some time to yourself. You can create that even within a family situation where you have your own sort of little private space. Uh, you might want to uh, go in a room, uh, read a book, read the Bible, um, get in a tub, light some candles or whatever to have your special time in your special space. If you also are in a family, it's important to come up with creative ways that stays in line with whatever your family's social norms are. Those things are going to be different for different families. So whatever you're, if you're the type of family that, you know, whenever you guys get a chance, you might play some board games, you might want to bring that out and do a little bit more of that. Or if you're the kind that might want to play charade or those type of things, you might want to do a little bit more of that. What's important about dealing with uh, the whole isolation is not 
getting to the point where you actually just kind of give into it and let the isolation take care, take over you because that's kind of easy to do and the next thing you know you know you're laying around on the couch or you're probably eating more than you normally would eat you're not getting your exercise you're not getting outside another thing important about actually getting outside in terms of how it helps your overall health you know we know that the sun is a natural um, provider vitamin D which is also going to be important to make sure your overall wellness so the better you feel overall the better you're going to be able to deal with the isolation so another thing that isolation can do is really impact your motivation to to do things um, you may uh, in the past have been a person, like I said before, that was extremely active and outgoing and now you don't have, um, you don't have that liberty. So it's things, other things that you can do to take care of that. Most of us are really sick, tab uh, sick tech savvy now, we're online all the time. So there are places that you can go online to actually engage yourself with things. Uh, I personally like um, playing games on the um, on my iPad and things like that. The biggest thing is just not giving in to the isolation and making sure that uh, that you stay engaged. Also, don't you know feel intimidated or shame about. Uh, reaching out because you are having those feelings of isolation uh, because I think to some degree we all are some some of us more so than others so feel free to uh, you know pick up the phone and and reach out and just let somebody know you know kind of how you feeling or just kind of talk things talking things through and I guess I'll just make a final point uh, about isolation to remember that you may feel like you're alone, but you do not have to be alone. Um, there are avenues that you can reach out to and make sure you take advantage of those things, the people that are around you. And another thing that I have found to be very, very rewarding to me, this is a time to nurture those relationships that are important to you that maybe you've said to yourself, uh, well, I'm going to call this person, I'm going to call this person, or I'm going to call my brother, I'm going to call my sister, I'm going to call my cousin I haven't talked to in a long time. Take this opportunity to rekindle relationships that, you know, have been kind of laying by the wayside for time to time, or make it an effort to sort of beef up your outreach to folks, people that you might need to check on, the elderly, folks who were homebound uh, from the beginning, even prior to COVID-19. I'm sure they are feeling this, the pressure of this even more so. Giving to others or extending ourselves to others just gives, it helps the person that you're helping and it also gives you a happy feeling. One thing I will say uh, about isolation, and I'm going to end on this, there is this phenomenon that's called the 15-minute marathon. And what that 15-minute marathon does is if you find yourself just kind of slow for a sinking and you don't have that motivation to get up, it's been said, and, it's, and this is actually supported by research, if you give yourself 15 minutes, you can set a timer or whatever and say, I'm going to give myself 15 minutes to go out and get some sun and to walk. I'm going to give myself 15 minutes to get up and go back in my carpet. I'm going to give myself 15 minutes to make some phone calls or whatever. What's been discovered in this research is that if you make it through this 15 minutes, you're probably going to be up and about and just at the point where you could probably even push farther. So try those things. Don't isolate. Uh, feel like that you're long. Please reach out. Thanks. I would like to thank uh, Ms. Carolyn McCorvey, our licensed certified social worker, for those coping and dealing mechanisms during this isolation of COVID-19. Um, I want to thank you all at home for taking your time out in your busy day to watch us um, today uh, discuss our segment on COVID-19. Again, I would like to thank our speakers, uh, Sister Kelly Denson, RN uh, Clinical Education Specialist, and also myself um, for discussing uh, what COVID-19 is and kind of giving us an idea of um, 
what are the best ways and the prevention and uh, treatments and how we can uh, eliminate and kind of decrease uh, the spread of this coronavirus. God bless and take care.